I'm glad Dominic mentioned the title. I spent a long time thinking about this title. Uh, it, in a sense, I hope the title tells the full content of the lecture. Road states and rampant bodies, metaphors of control in public and private worlds. Um, I'm hoping in, in this paper to uh, indicate the role of metaphor in uh, showing how humans adapt to, to change. Let me stop there, that annoying, annoying little thing. Just pop me up one more time. Yes, do pop me up there. Um, I'm going to explore in particular some instances of how those in power, primarily politicians, um, use metaphor for purposes of social control. Um, I'm interested in metaphor uh, because it's, it's really become, uh, it's shifted from being an area of outline and peripheral interest to becoming very central to uh, our linguistic inquiry with the emergence of cognitive linguistics and um, the notion of uh, embodiment implying that meaning itself originates in the experience of, of, our, of our bodies, of which our brains are a part, um, as they interact with spatial and social environments. Um, I'm going to, in particular, in this lecture, also try to explore how critical discourse analysts actually employ metaphor to understand some of the processes of social change by revealing uh, mechanisms of control, the mechanisms through which politicians exert control. Um, and then I'm going to move on in, into a slightly, perhaps more postmodern direction by thinking about how people experiencing illness, a range of illnesses, who we might describe as, at least in one stage, as being powerless, powerless and how they use metaphor for uh, understanding change in, in themselves. So I, I hope to show how both politicians and people experiencing illness uh, use metaphors relating to processes of control, of loss of control, and of subsequently regaining control. And then also how critical discourse analysts, in particular Sontag, and Foucault employ metaphor to give insight into these processes. So I'm going to begin with a straightforward question, what is, what is metaphor? Just to give an idea of my, my take on metaphor. Now, if you ask 10 metaphor scholars to count the number of metaphors in a text, you're as likely as not to come up with 10 different answers. Um, for me, this is not actually a problem as such, and I'll explain why in a minute. So, beginning with Aristotle, who proposed that uh, metaphor consists in giving uh, the thing a name that belongs to something else, this highlights perhaps two core ideas about metaphor. That it requires two elements, and um, some form of exchange or interaction between them. As Samuel Johnson noted, metaphor gives, requires um, gives you two ideas for one. So, um, Richards uh, then, I think, makes a very significant comment. The mind is a connecting organ. It works only by connecting, and it can connect any two things in an, an indefinitely large number of ways. This is in his work, The Philosophy of Rhetoric. Now, this again brings us to two key features of metaphor. It concerns thought as well as language, and it enables us to explore different ways of thinking about things. A more recent uh, definition of metaphor I've given is the third one there. A metaphor is a figure of speech that results from a shift in the use of a word or phrase from a context in which it has um, a more basic meaning to another context where it has a less basic meaning. And a more basic meaning is one that is either more concrete, more related to bodily experience in some way, or a historically earlier meaning. Now, um, it seems to me that in this definition, which comes from a group known as the Praggle Jazz Group, um, it actually tells what, what is important about this definition is that it, says it implies that a metaphor is created when a word is used in 
a new, a fresh context. And this use of the word arises from some perception of resemblance between the original context and the novel context. Now, for me, this perception of a resemblance between two different entities is actually um, an individual matter. We, individuals will actually differ in the extent to which they perceive resemblances. It's an act of interpretation. Therefore, um, for me, metaphor is not something that pre-exists language. It's something, it's a relationship that is created by language in the act of interpretation and is independent on the, on the viewer. So metaphors don't actually inhere in the senses of words. Words are not as bored as metaphors. But metaphors arise from how words are used in specific contexts. And whether these contexts are interpreted or as novel or not will depend on the individual's perspective of, of whether a sense is more basic or less basic. So it seems to me that, that, it, that it is discourse context that is actually crucial in enabling us to identify what a metaphor is in the first place. And only critical discourse analysis that enables us to identify the role and the purpose of metaphor in creating uh, social relationships that relate to control. So um, that brings us to the question of uh, what is metaphor for? Well, an example of, of what I would consider to be a metaphor, and through this lecture I put metaphors in italics. So, Putin anoints Medvedev as successor. The basic sense of anointing refers to some form of religious ritual in which the body is greased with oils or unguents, melted butter or whatever, and the person who's anointed is symbolically exposed to a divine influence or power of some sort. So, of course, in the Bible, uh, the divinely appointed king is referred to as the anointed. So, it seems to me clearly we, we have here uh, a, a metaphor, and um, we can see that it is, a me it is a metaphor that has a certain perspective on a situation. Um, here we see in these images the proximity of um, Putin to Medved Medved Medvedev implies a relationship between them, a relationship of influence, of control. Therefore, the choice of a metaphor such as anointing implies, in this case, perhaps a somewhat negative evaluation because it implies that um, uh, Putin is the, 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 the puppet master, if you like, pulling the strings in some way. So, um, metaphor controls how we actually view a situation. Sometimes not necessarily consciously when the word is actually chosen by uh, whoever it was who, who, who used that word, anoints. So um, the answer to the question of what metaphor is for actually depends entirely on who is using the metaphor and in what specific context and with what purpose. So um, the sorts of purposes that metaphor may be used for, well, typically in the development and emergence of language, metaphor fills semantic gaps. It provides words for, for concepts that are as yet unlexicalized in some way. That would be a, a, a lexico lexicological perspective on what a metaphor is. But in, um, we all know that there are diverse other um, roles of metaphor. Rhetoricians using it to persuade, of course, literary studies, stylistics explores the aesthetic effect of metaphor. Scientists employ metaphor for theory development, for modeling situations. Journalists, typically financial journalists, for example, employ metaphor to arouse and stimulate interest, to add color. Educators employ metaphor to, as a heuristic to uh, illustrate new concepts. Social theorists employ metaphor to provide some form of a social model of some type, as we're going to see with uh, uh, Foucault a little later on. And then, of course, critical discourse analysts use metaphor, as I hope to show you, to reveal how social control is uh, executed. So, for me, metaphor is a type of uh, a life force in language. It's a life force in language both for the creation of new words as old words take on new meanings in some way on the basis of resemblance, <clears throat> but it's also 
a type of uh, life force in that it, it, it satisfies such a diverse range of, uh, of rhetorical functions for, in particular areas of intellectual activity. So um, there is a reason as, as, as to why metaphors mean what they mean. For, for me, uh, meaning is much more motivated in metaphor than it is in actual individual words, where the relationship between the form and the sense is a somewhat arbitrary one. There's no real belonging of, of sense. Whereas in metaphors, we can actually explore what it is that creates their meaning, what motivates them in some way. So, the world is not directly accessible, but is conceptually represented in our minds. But these concepts originate in our experience of our, of our bodies. And metaphor serves some symbolic purposes in connecting minds and bodies and overcoming divisions and tensions between them. Now, um, what I'm going to, what I'm hoping, this is a, a kind of mapping out of the argument for the remainder of this lecture and this diagram. So just to sort of um, explain how it is, uh, the, 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 the general theory of metaphor that I'm presenting to you here today. Metaphor is a means of adaptation to change. A, a means by which people express their conceptual understanding of change. Change creates uncertainty. It creates uncertainty both at the emotional level about feelings of losing control and the need to uh, restore control in some way in order to re-establish an emotional order. And change also leads to uncertainty in a moral sense, in a, in, in a more perhaps public world of political uh, agency and activities. So um, the moral sense also requires some aspect of control to preserve a type of moral order. So the impact of change on the self has both an emotional and a moral dimension to it. Now, for me, metaphor emerges from thinking the thoughts that, uh, that, that the self has, as they are manifested in language, produce metaphors, and metaphors are a means by which the emotional tensions created by change are mediated and resolved in some way. And um, thought is also active in uh, mediating the tensions that are brought about by disruptions to the moral order through po political events, typically. And politicians characteristically develop metaphors and metaphor systems that mediate uh, deontic conflict tensions in deontic conflict in some way. I'm going to explore the emotional dimension at the end of the lecture when I look at um, the use of metaphor in the language of people experiencing illness and the moral dimension more in the first part where I'm going to explore the use of metaphor by politicians and how that, how that works. Okay, so um, Metaphor, what I call metaphor and control schema in public worlds or political worlds, I see there being, if you like, three uh, main aspects to how politicians employ metaphor. They employ metaphor as a means of gaining control in the first place, typically metaphors associated with struggle, fighting, effort, also metaphors associated with motion and movement, and they also employ metaphors to do with seeing, knowing, understanding, and envisaging. All of these sorts of metaphors tend to have a positive evaluation of themselves and who they represent. Politicians also employ metaphor to express feelings associated with loss of control. Losing control typically over boundaries in some way. When metaphors are used in this sense, they have a negative evaluation. And I'm going to illustrate that typically with reference to immigration discourse. And then metaphors are used again when uh, politicians want to represent themselves as regaining control over situations that are disordered in some way. 
um, where control needs to be re-established. And there they shift back again to having uh, a, a positive evaluation of some sort. Okay, so examples. Um, in a, in the, the politicians and, and rhetoric, I analyzed six uh, Anglo-Saxon politicians, three American and three British. And I found that um, control metaphors occurred in all of those, but particularly in the language of Margaret Thatcher, and particularly um, uh, a, a concept which I feel accounts for her use of metaphor, which is an um, attempt at control is struggle with a force of some type. So um, I, I put a, a, a couple of examples here uh, in italics of the sorts of metaphors that originate in this source domain of struggle, words like pitch, pitch, dig in, conquer, to fight, to struggle. Now, um, of course, the conceptual basis of these sorts of metaphors and why they were actually rhetorically successful for Margaret Thatcher where they activated a whole schema for survival, if you like, because um, they, there's a basic knowledge for survival in terms of groups in, engaged in conflict with each other, struggling over a territory, a space of some sort, um, with uh, some type of strategy in mind in order to uh, succeed or to be victorious in some way, possibly through building up systems of allies and, and, associ and associations. Um, so there is, if you like, a whole schema of uh, force dynamics, which is at work. And the use of these sorts of metaphors that are based in this, uh, this schema for, for struggle and conflict um, are rhetorically effective because they not only heighten the spectacle, the drama of the political engagement, which of course is very important for a rhetorician, but um, they also clarify uncertainty, and this was an aspect that Tony Blair admired considerably in Thatcher, the way her ability to see things in black and white and to uh, eliminate um, uncertainty in some way. So um, this, this is, I think, it's an important group of, of metaphors, if you like. Okay, uh, what other types of metaphors? Well, let's move on to uh, New Labour. Now, for New Labour, a type of new metaphor group emerged, which is, I would summarise conceptually, uh, creating, gaining control is creating what is good. And this is illustrated through the use of creative type verbs of the type in the examples there. So, name, foundations, creating, shaping, crafting, forging, all these verbs that imply a uh, creative activity on the part of the agent, of course, imply a very strong positive evaluation of their, of their activity. So, um, here we have an emerging Tony Blair, creatively uh, impaling a range of his followers on that uh, compass, and uh, the image is intended to indicate the, 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 the way that these metaphors are actually used to, to dominate and control through the way that they create uh, certainty. Another very important uh, group of metaphors, and actually the group of metaphors that are the most frequent, I, I, I would suggest, in political language generally, are those associated with motion and movement in some way. So this is the another major group of control metaphors, uh, typically uh, in, in the use by New Labour, found occurring in uh, nominal groups, as in the examples here with uh, now. So we have journeys of renewal, journeys, journeys of change, journeys of conviction, journeys of transformation. Everything's a, a, a you know a, a journey in a nominal group, but very commonly it. So, um, these, what, what is significant in terms of how, how power is performed rhetorically here is that, of course, the, um, the agent becomes totally invisible in these sorts of metaphors. We don't, we don't have any indication of exactly who's going on the journey, who's the guide, if you like. The guide is, con the guide is concealed. So, it creates, if you like, it naturalizes 
um, a, a process through which is being executed by the party in power, whose policies are represented as being journeys or voyages of, in, in some way. Um, these sorts of, of metaphors obviously imply the ability to see the, the future in some way, to, to, to envisage where, where you might be going. So, with these motion metaphors, they, um, they imply a purposeful agent in some way, who's heading towards a predetermined destination, the vision, if you like, and they are associated with this controlling agent moving along a path in some way. And uh, there's an example here from uh, Peter Hain, which uh, describes the uh, peace process in Northern Ireland. Uh, the government have a responsibility to make sure that devolution can take place quickly when the assembly requests it. There's been a long and difficult road to reach that point, but all sides have shown determination and commitment to take Northern Ireland forward, and I commend them in doing so. I have no doubt that any remaining obstacles can be negotiated before journeys end at Parliament buildings. So we have a whole cluster of journey metaphors that all imply this purposeful agency in some way. Okay, so um, another interesting metaphor, which is related to this idea of motion, and also with the idea of control being a struggle with a force in some way, is the use of the verb to harness. Now, I put some examples here from New Labour language, uh, harnessing new technology in these, all these examples. And if you look at the verb harness as, new, as used in New Labour, the objects the objects are all the object nouns are always um, the working people or technology, which in itself is interesting because it creates a type of equivalence between the two. So, um, what is it that's being activated at the, uh, the the schematic level here? Well, of course, har horses are harnessed so that they can be controlled, and the agent that is controlling them is a, a skillful rider who's in command of a large. Uh, moving force of some sort. Um, so, very appropriate for technology, if you like. Um, but it also implies that this is a resource that can be manipulated or should be manipulated and controlled. I don't know how much the trade unions would go along with that, um, whether harness was an appropriate verb for um, how, they, how they felt about their, their, their own role in determining social change. So, um, again, what's significant here is the invisibility of control. We don't see the rider, we don't know who the rider is, we just know that something needs to be harnessed in some way. Okay, um, so moving to the uh, perhaps an abstract uh, representation of this, um, the cognitive linguist Talmi says the primary distinction that language marks here is the role difference between two entities exerting forces. So there's one force entity is singled out for focal attention. The salient issue in the interaction is whether that, this entity is able to manifest its force tendency or on the contrary is overcome in some way. So I suggest that this, is a, this force schema is something that actually explains both how um, the struggle and conflict metaphors work and, if you like, how the motion and movement metaphors work. But there's also a struggle between two entities, um, if you like, the, the rider and the thing that is ridden in some way. So, um, Tommy has the, the, uses the terms uh, agonist and antagonist, so there are the two forces. Uh, each have an intrinsic force tendency that's either towards action or towards rest. And um, the result of the force of the interaction will again be either towards action or rest. So there's a balance of strengths between the two force, ent force entities, and there will be a stronger one and a weaker one. Um, there's, of course, an inherent dualism that underlies this, the, the, if you like, this force schema, this differentiation between the agonist and the, and the antagonist. But I suggest it's very much at work both in the, uh, the control or conflict metaphors of Margaret Thatcher, where she profiles her own role as an, as, as an agonist, and that of opponents, whether they're trade unions, political opponents, or economic problems like inflation. 
as the antagonist in some way, something that needs to be imposed upon. Okay, so um, moving on now to ideas of loss of control, the second group of, of metaphors. Um, now, loss of control is particularly associated in, in public discourse with um, the idea of morality being control over boundaries in some way. Now, the, um, as some of you will remember, the, the last 2005 election campaign was very much fought over the issue on by the Conservative Party, over the issue of immigration. And um, it, it, it was developed by their Australian campaign manager, because it had been very successful in Australia, and it was thought that by profiling immigration, it would be uh, a, a vote winner, but of course it was, it was not, it, it didn't have that outcome. But um, immigration became an issue, or is an issue, for the political right, um, because it, I will suggest, it implies that uh, a moral stance in which controlling boundaries, the boundaries of, of a space, in this case typically the Britain as an island, is actually a moral project. It's a moral endeavour. This is done because, um, according to this discourse, um, immigration is illegal, a lot of it is supposedly illegal, and therefore because the process through which people arrive there is illegal, they will therefore go on to behave as criminals once they're here, which of course is not a, actually uh, a logical um, argument as such. So these metaphors based on the ideas of um, also of the need for government to be in control is to operate a competent system of immigration. So a lot of the metaphors that were used um, in this campaign were designed to, to illustrate that the Labour government was not competent in controlling national boundaries. It had lost control of, of these boundaries, so it didn't have a, uh, an effective system of control. So it was, if you like, a, uh, a way of highlighting um, the sorts of fears that, that, that could arise when the moral order of the boundaries uh, collapses or is challenged. So here's a few examples uh, of the use of this type of metaphor by the, in this case, the uh, extreme political right. We have typically um, the idea that loss of control is loss of control over a force through expressions like limitless flow of immigration. There's a force there, massive unnecessary waves of immigration, and nightly tidal waves of asylum seekers. So all these, all these metaphors um, imply um, um, losing control, fear of losing control over a large force that's arriving. And there it is, it's coming up like a tidal wave, washing over the, the poor uh, national ship, threatened by that great surf of immigrants tumbling over it. Although this cartoon itself comes um, from an earlier, an earlier period. So, um, Metaphors for loss of control are typically associated with words like floods, as in the example here. We have generally um, water-type metaphors. In fact, typically we have uh, what I would call liquid metaphors. So we have flows, waves, tides, okay? Now, these liquid metaphors are um, significant in this right-wing discourse on immigration because they activate uh, a disaster scenario and they imply that immigration is a natural disaster in the same way as flooding and um, being uh, overwhelmed by this huge entity. They also, of course, activate the metaphor of a container because if something's going to be uh, overwhelmed by a great quantity, then there's also that something itself, which is a bounded entity in some way, which uh, in this case of right-wing political language is typically the nation. So the nation is a type of container. The nation needs protection. The nation needs protection from danger and disaster in some way. And here we see the uncertainty created by um, this way of thinking about immigration. Here we have a figure representing um, the, na the nation state um, ironically plugging his 
thumb in, in, in this great tidal wave that's uh, going to be overwhelming. We have the idea here of the nation as uh, a physical body, as a human body, a human body that is also a type of container. And of course, it's very easy to conceptualize an island space as a body because of the clear definition of its boundaries. So um, a body and an island are both bounded spaces, and a container is also a bounded space. So the nation can be conceptualized as a container, or indeed the, um, the body can be conceptualized as an island. So um, the way it works by using the, the container source domain is, of course, that a container has an inside and an outside. Inside the container are the natives, the British, the us, and outside the container are the them, the foreigners, those who are not part of our group. Movement in and out of the container weakens its boundaries in this modeling of um, uh, immigration. Uh, and leads to social change. And you remember that my claim is that metaphor is actually to deal with the uncertainty arising from social change. Pressure on the container can rupture it in some way. And I would also suggest that the uh, appeal of this schema to right-wing political thinking is the idea that by exerting control over the movements of peoples, over the, the bounded entity of the Island, you can also control change over time. You can change, you can control social change because those entities that move across boundaries bring about change with them. And change is particularly fearful to the, um, the, the right. So that's, um, uh, the, 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 this is manifested then through concepts of a place being full up, there being pressure on it the need to secure borders, and we can see it here, in this image, as um, Britain is a container threatened with loss of control. I've put um, a quote there of the idea of bursting at, bursting at the seams. So here we have um, the human trafficker stuffing endless bodies into this stretched case of an island. Again, we can see the idea that there is fear in this schema of uh, penetration from without, so the bounded space is being penetrated in, through the, the bottom end there. There's also um, disaster, a feeling of disaster arising from um, pressure from within. There's the, it's getting stretched, it's, it, it's, it, it, there's pressure on the seams, if you like. So um, moral order in the right-wing schema requires uh, a fixing of the boundaries so that they don't, they don't break and uh, stopping the entities coming in from coming in. Okay, I'd now like to move on to, to showing uh, how uh, uh, critical discourse analysts, amongst whom I would include uh, Foucault, how and the, the right-wing in general uh, employ metaphor critically. Before we do that, though, another thought. Um, metaphor, okay. metaphor provides insight into the right wing psyche. Control over time, I would suggest, is control over space. So in this case, I have two, two spaces that are very confined, and um, the idea of them being the idea of them being fixed in space is a way of stopping the process of change from taking place in some way. Now, well, now um, Foucault, in his in his work, um, discipline and punishment, in particular. Uh, identified the way that institutions exert control over the individuals whom they house. And uh, he used metaphor very extensively by referring to uh, institutions as glass cells, as theatres, as machines. And actually, his whole way of conceptualizing institutions was based on a, a metaphor of spatial relations. So that the spatial relations that are evident in an institution uh, it's typically a prison, which we'll look at in a minute, 
becomes a metaphor for the type of control, the type of social control that is imposed over the individual. So um, this was his prison design, uh, known as the panopticon. The panopticon was a circular design shown in the view from above there, the plan, and all that's needed is, is to have a single supervisor in a central location uh, in the middle, and they can then view each of the individual cells that radiates out from that central location, whether it houses a, a madman, a kept condemned man, a, a schoolboy, um, and the entities that are in those spaces can be observed. They can be seen, they can be profiled, and you can see the, the sorts of metaphors Foucault use here. Cages, theatres, in which each actor is alone. There's another plan of the Panopticon, designed uh, by uh, Jeremy Bentham, the British social reformer. And again, you can see the use that Foucault makes here of metaphor. I can't read these out because I'm running a little short of time. But uh, the prison machine, the cell of visibility, the glass house of the Greek philosopher, the operation, the theatre. Metaphor is extensive in how he conceptualises social control through the structure of buildings, the architecture of buildings. So to be seen, and to be seen is crucial in the way that control in Paris executed through Foucault's historical analysis of the emergence of institutions, to be seen is to be known and also to be controlled. So the panoptican arrangement is such that the observer can at a quick glance see over all the individuals who are contained within the various cells there. As opposed to the ruined prisons, littered with mechanisms of torture, the panopticon presents a cruel, ingenious cage. There we have some more cruel, ingenious cages for the apparatus of justice. So the panopticon is a type of royal menagerie. The animal is replaced by man. Individual distribution by specific grouping and the king by the machinery of assertive power. With this exception, the panopticon also does the work of a naturalist. It makes it possible to draw up differences among patients, to observe the symptoms of each individual without the proximity of beds, the circulation of miasmas, the effects of contagion, confusing the clinical tables. Spatial metaphor was also identified through Foucault's analysis of the asylum, and he traced historically the way that uh, first lepers and then plague victims were separated physically from the rest of society, and they came through uh, modernism, in, in, in modernist thinking which he critically analyzes, he indicates the way that they came to represent unreason, so that illness came to, to symbolize unreason, and therefore the institution, whether it was the asylum or the prison, came to symbolize reason and rationality by creating a, a space of confinement in some way. So, I would like to suggest that what Foucault was saying in the 1970s when, that, when he wrote that was actually, um, if you like, a prediction of, the, of very many aspects of the society we see in now, which is becoming a cell of visibility, in which to be seen is to be known and to be controlled. Power is executed in modern society through controlling systems of observation. Individuals attract constantly in their everyday lives through uh, the proliferation of computer records on their credit worthiness, on every aspect of their personal life, so that there's more, you're, what is stored on databases is sometimes more than you know yourself. There's constant surveillance of some humans by others, creates a continuous prison through which control is realized in some way. Surveillance proliferates in every dimension of public life, in, I'm thinking here of Britain, the most over-surveilled country probably in Europe. Offices, shops, cameras, surveillance cameras are everywhere. All collecting data, sending it somewhere, and all in the name of terrorism and uh, the prevention of crime. And there are, of course, multitudinous uh, social agents. So that the, uh, the, the terrorist is a type of leper, a modern-day leper, 
and uh, we have all become part of the disciplinary project. And here we have another quote from Foucault. And in order to be exercised, this power had to be given the instrument of permanent, exhaustive, omnipresent surveillance, capable of making all visible, as long as it could itself remain invisible. You never know who's at the other end you're looking at at the film collected on these cameras. It had to be like a faceless gaze that transformed the whole social body into a field of perception. Thousands of eyes posted everywhere, mobile attentions ever on the alert, a long hierarchized network. So, um, that's, uh, the, the metaphor of the gaze is crucial in, meta in Foucault's understanding of these issues. The gaze is all-powerful and all-seeing. Okay, um, I'm actually going to, for the reasons of time, <coughs> go rather quickly through, uh, through this bit, which relates to Tony Blair's conceptualization of evil and the notion of the, um, the rogue state. Of course, um, the identification of evil is crucial to uh, a, a legitimacy project by a rhetorician. And um, I would suggest that the, the use of the word rogue, which became predominant um, only actually quite recently in British political discourse, the expression rogue state was used once in Hansard, 89 to 92, 68 times in the period 2002 to 2004. So it, what's, what, why is that metaphor potent? A rogue implies both danger, threat, it also implies criminality, so it activates both human criminality, also animal threat, because of notions of the rogue bull and the rogue elephant as well. So it's, it naturalizes, it creates a myth of some sort, and it creates a moral agent who's, uh, who becomes moral through control over the rogue state that is a type of rampant body. And if we look in Hansard, we see evidence of this, um, a question nicely served up for a definition of a rogue state, linked in here, of course, with WMD. And um, this is basically uh, a legitimacy claim, of course. Once you've labelled something as a rogue state, then it becomes a necessity by uh, the, the agents in charge of moral order to protect any such state. So I'm going to swiftly move through that. I'd like to move on now to um, the last area of metaphor use. Illness experience. Um, now, regaining control is destroying illness. Um, the idea of the body politic as a source domain for society was a very predominant one, identified first of all by Susan Sontag in which um, civil disorder is associated in some way with illness and the restoration of order is, if you like, the elimination of illness and the restoration of balance. By having the idea of the body politic and uh, making the society like a human body, illness then could automatically be legitimately attacked and destroyed. So anything represented as related to illness could um, it was necessary on the part of the agents to eliminate. This is, of course, why disease metaphors have become so predominant in political argumentation. They contain within them a fundamental moral argument about what it's right to do, which is to end the disease. Um, those are some, you can look at uh, Sontag if you like, but I'm not going to spend time on that. Foucault also uh, explored disease with the idea of seeing a disease being to know it. So the, the emergence of anatomy as a discipline, the idea of it being acceptable to open the human body and to look at it would be also to gain understanding over the disease that had been inflicted on it in some way. Now, um, disease is, is rather different in a, in a postmodern point of view because um, in, in, in postmodern perspectives, uh, illness is, of course, something negative, and metaphor is very commonly used um, in order to express feelings about loss of control in some way. 
And there is a significant role for metaphor in therapy in order for the individual to regain control from the feeling that they are on a, a purposeful journey of some sort. So this is taken from a, a man experiencing depression, talking about lack of control and uh, feelings of loss of control in some way. And here's another example from uh, a man experiencing depression who's making a contrast between being in control when he was in work, running a company, and being out of control when he was experiencing a particular illness. So again, there's a control schema that's very much at work here. The same force metaphors that applied in the political domain also imply in the private domain. So there's a struggle between the agonist and the antagonist. The agonist is the agent that's struggling to gain control over, over the illness, and the antagonist is the, the illness. Sorry I'm having to whistle through these in order not to mess up the schedule. So um, lack of control is lack of control over, over a force, uh, the force of illness in some way. Okay? So in, in the case here, the, this man speaks of not being able to bear the pressure, metaphor, feelings of not being in control, and a feeling of being empty, again, the, the container, the idea of the body as a container. So we have um, a substance with pressure, the emotion. We have pr pressure on the container, which is the emotion causing the self to respond. And the greater the pressure, the more um, intense the emotion. There's again this inherent dualism between the ideas of being in or out of control. The sorts of motion metaphors that are employed uh, to communicate regaining control are some ex one or two examples here. The I ideas of there being a path to recovery, um, there being a route, in this case with the support of carers, this person talks about the voluntary route to medicate, to uh, cure. Positive steps. So there's the idea of um, the creation of a heroic identity is a form of therapeutic control. So that the individual, so the metaphors of motion in this case are used by the individual to represent their purposeful efforts to regain the control of their life that's been challenged by, by illness. This um, sum up summarizes the conceptualization. So illness causes change in the body, emotional disruption in some way, and metaphor is very heavily involved in the expression of feelings of loss of control in the first place, and then other types of metaphor, like motion journey metaphors, are used to conceptualize self-control and recovery from the illness. So uh, in, in summary really of um, what I've tried to argue in, in, in this lecture or present to you is the idea of um, change creating some sort of um, disruption there being, if you like, a conflict between the moral self, the desire for, for, for morality and certainty, and the emotional self that both of these are challenged in both the, in the public and private domains of experience. Um, feelings of control arise when reason or morality uh, predominate over feelings of emotion, as uh, typically in political language. Feelings of loss of control uh, emerge when emotion is exceeding or greater than morality and reason. And, um, in the case of illness, that can contribute, that can actually be an important stage, the expression of feelings of loss of control, in order to express the, uh, the emotional dimension of illness. Metaphors very significantly involved um, with both dimensions of control, and metaphor is, if you like, a, an adaptive process in language that corresponds with, um, if you like, natural selection in this evolution of the species, so that the, uh, in the way that the species adapt to changing circumstances, so metaphor permits 
language to adapt to the experiences and the thoughts that individuals are encountering when they're challenged and threatened uh, by change. And that, um, that is really the last uh, slide to, to summarize that process. Okay, that's, uh, sorry, I missed the, there's a few references. 